what is the process of creating a cover for Vogue like from concept to publication? Yes, yeah, so from my experience, obviously the covers always start with the talent. Once you have the talent in place, and that will be because they either have an album to promote. I go through the list of film releases, album releases, maybe it's Kate Blanchett doing Hedda Gabler on Broadway. And that gives us a sense of the schedule. And then obviously we have to make sure, especially in the last five years of my time at US Vogue, but definitely my five years at British Vogue, that there's diversity of body, of nationality, even especially with British Vogue. We couldn't have a bunch of Americans. We had to take into account that the Vogue reader is not just one person. So looking over the 12 months, you know, the 12 covers a year, we had to make sure there was a diverse group of women we were putting on our cover to reflect and to speak to our diverse readership. So it was a puzzle just to make sure it kind of all fits into place. And then we also had to think about the photographers as well. And as we got later at Vogue, the celebrities would have a say in the photographer. And then where are they based? So that would also dictate the photographer and their dates, the photographer's dates, the editor's dates. Who was doing another story in the issue? If Grace was doing a huge fantasy story like Alice in Wonderland, she wouldn't be doing the cover of that same issue. So it's the puzzle pieces up, and then there is who works well with the photographer. Grace and Annie were a great team. Mario and Tani. So all of those things would define when the shoot was, who was shooting it, where it was. Then thinking about this, the talent, in the later years, a lot of them have these big designer endorsement deals. Did we just have Dior on the cover last month? Then we really can't do Jennifer Lawrence next month. We can't, we're also not gonna have the same advertiser on the cover. So it really was kind of moving pieces around, but you know, thankfully there's, there was an abundance of, of beautiful, talented talent. So, we were able to kind of make it all work. Sometimes I'd be annoyed if we couldn't just wait to do one talent instead of doing her now, because that would keep open something like the September cover. The September cover was obviously the most important, but not a lot of films come out in September. So it was always the trickiest one for me to book. So I would want to, it'd have to be an evergreen talent and if, if the talent had a movie that was gonna be an Oscar film, that was usually a December release and September was too early for to promote a December film. So I had, same with March. March is a very second biggest issue of the year, but also you have the Oscars happening. It's not early enough for this cover to be used as part of an Oscar campaign because voting has already happened. And you have the February films that tended to be um, romantic comedies. So I always had a good Sandra Bullock, Miss Congeniality coming out in February. So I knew I could get kind of like a Deborah Messing with comedians because that's when their films typically came out. But I always had to say, let's think of September 1st and work backwards. Don't use Rihanna for April. We're going to need her for September because it also had to be a big fashion person. So that was always something people were sometimes just thinking about next month and I'm thinking about the whole year. So that was, you know, one of the challenges for me, but it, yeah, it starts with talent and then we build the team and then we think about the fashion concept and then, yeah, then we fit the um, writer. I think the writer is super important. I knew that Jonathan Van Meter, a dear friend of mine did really well with some of the, let's say more difficult talent. Um, so he would be someone we'd put on. And my opinion was if Jonathan did the first cover with Angelina, why wouldn't you have him do the second cover? A new writer is going to have to go over everything he's already spoken to her about. 
this is great because our reader is still reading Vogue. They've read about how she grew up and all of this. Why not? Why can't this be the second chapter, assuming our readers have already read the first? So that was something we started doing. And there's already a comfort level built in there. I think the first hour of an interview is just, you can trust me. I don't know if I can, you know, that warming them up for lack of a better word. So that um, is something we started doing, but I've had situations where the writer has had to be changed due to um, the first interview session not going too well or a celebrity pulling out because of the experience. So that that's also, it's, it's all about personality. Who's gonna get the most out of the talent? What's the best combination? And that's with editor, photographer, writer. That's the comfort, you know. And in your opinion, what is crucial for developing and maintaining A-level relationships? That is easy. It's trust, 100% trust. Um, since I'm the person that was in the direct contact with both sides, I needed to play a master negotiator. So both people need to believe you're working just for them, for their best interest. But there's a way to do it where both trust you. So one side doesn't need to know what you've kind of negotiated on the other side, likewise. So, you know, it's, a, it's about them trusting that you have their best interest at heart, which I did, you know, I did have to sit on the fence a bit because I didn't want, I would never say, for instance, Anna says, you have to wear this. I would say something like, oh, Anna just saw this collection and thought it would be beautiful on you. What do you think? You know, if, if someone felt like they're being forced to do something and their voice wasn't being heard or even acknowledged that they had a voice, that was right away. It was going to be a no because they were feeling like they're being forced to do something again. There'd be a situation. Well, if she doesn't say yes, then we're canceling the cover. Well, there's a different way to put that. So it's almost like I was filtering things through this machine and then so I, and I never lied ever. I just didn't always repeat exactly what I was told to tell the person I said it in a softer way. So I think definitely trust. And yeah, it's always going to be about managing egos and the publicists I work with, who I'm very close friends with, and I've known them for 25 years, they're dealing with the same thing. So we're kind of like real estate brokers. We both want to get the deal done. How we speak to our clients or bosses or bosses, that's on us to get the deal done. So, you know, it was a lot of, okay, so how about if you say this or, you know, really strategizing, we both want this cover to happen. How can we get your client and my boss to feel, yeah, this is exactly how I saw it was going to be, you know? So that's, it's a lot of, yeah, negotiation, but definitely trust. Um, and I still am super close to everyone I've, I've worked with. So what advice would you give to young professionals aspiring to make a mark in the fashion and entertainment sectors? The advice I was given when I started um, at Vogue was actually from Kevin Huvane's brother, Stephen Huvane, who is a huge publicist, I mean, a legend, like his brother. Um, he has Gwyneth, Julianne Moore, Jennifer Aniston. He said to me, Jill, just make sure people take your call when it's just Jill Demling and not Jill Demling from Vogue. And that was something that always stuck with me. And that's just about, again, kindness and Having from Vogue gives you power, right? So use your power for good was what I always thought about. I would meet talent and if they were nice people, I'd want to do whatever I could to support them. If I met talent, no matter how 
vain as they were, and they were not nice people, I wasn't going to support them. So that's one thing, definitely to not take advantage of the power of that title, Vogue. That's not Jill Demling's power, it's my power when I was at Vogue, but I made sure that I was always respectful. And again, that leads back to why my relationships are still so strong. Um, also, I would say don't lose your integrity in any job you do. You are going to be held by your decisions and not only your decisions, but what decisions you enabled. And that doesn't mean that I could fight against everything, but at least I made my voice heard and known. So I never was quiet. If I felt strongly about someone, I made it known. A lot of times it's good to put it in an email so you have receipts. <laughs> um, but also when I didn't like what I was hearing or what someone's saying or how they would refer to someone, I made that clear as well. So, you know, I just think it's owning your decisions or your compliance. If you don't make your voice known, you could be blamed and you could feel shame, basically. I just made sure I never regretted anything. And then I knew and I know I did everything I could in the situation I was in. I didn't have the final say. I only had so much power, but I made it clear that I wasn't, I wasn't going to be quiet. Basically.